Welcome to The Breakdown with Brad Corp and Becky, a weekly podcast that breaks down politics, policy, and current affairs. I'm Becky Scher, and yet again, we have our special guest host, Jeff Kolb, standing in for Michael Bradcorp. In today's episode, we're pleased to welcome two guests for the first time ever. We'll start local by chatting with Curtis Hanna to break down the legalization of marijuana here in Minnesota and the push to legalize other drugs. We will then be joined with Brian Strasser. Brian will join us to break down the biggest story of the week, the Trump indictment and what it means for the former president and current frontrunner for the Republican nomination. Finally, we'll end this show with our typical tweets of the week and the food fight with Broadcorp and Becky, featuring our guest host, Jeff Kolb, of course, as well as Brian Strasser. This week, we'll be debating favorite barbecue side dishes. We're excited for you to be joining us today. And Jeff, thanks for being our stand-in guest host again. I'm excited to be here. Becky, this is normally where we do the small talk, but no small talk today. We got a big show. We got to get this in. Uh, Let's get going. So let's roll right into our first guest. Uh, If you've been listening to the show, you know that the I've got a theme here for the next few weeks as I'm guest hosting, which is uh, uh, inviting people on who people I've never met in real life, but know from Twitter. And so uh, the, the, our next guest uh, fits into that description perfectly. Uh, our guest is uh, Curtis Hanna, who has um, lots of titles. I see, I see lots of kind of titles or different organizations that uh, you're involved with. Did you wanna, um, did you wanna use a preferred title or kind of explain a little bit about who you are? Yeah, definitely. Essentially, I'm a drug policy reform lobbyist at the Minnesota legislature. Um, I have run for office twice. I ran as a Republican for House of Representatives in 2012 and ran for mayor of Minneapolis in 2013. Uh, But primarily I um, got involved with drug policy with cannabis uh, by co-founding Minnesota Normal. It's an advocacy group that's been working for over 50 years now to try to legalize cannabis and uh, most recently, I was their uh, contract lobbyist this last session. So I, I did notice that. So Normal, is a, is that a nationwide organization? And then you're kind of like a local chapter. Is that how that works? Exactly. We're the state affiliate of the national organization. Okay. And then you were a, you were a registered lobbyist in the last session. Is that the first year that you've been a lobbyist or were you had you been a lobbyist prior to that? Yeah, I was working as a citizen lobbyist, uh, but essentially the last five sessions I've been down there uh, full time while they've been for, in session. with normal or oh, just I, the... I was doing it independently for a while there. Uh, like I said, as a citizen lobbyist and okay. um, yeah, last uh, two sessions ago. So last year was my first year as a, a paid lobbyist for Minnesota normal. Okay, cool. Um so you actually answered some of my questions I was going to ask already. So that that's good, very efficient. Uh, so let me let me just set the stage. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter or know me at all, I am like the most anti marijuana person probably uh, probably that you know. I don't know unless you maybe have like an angry grandpa that you know who's more anti marijuana than me. Um, but I invited Curtis on. I, I really wanted to to understand kind of where things are. Uh, where we think things are going, and I just wanted to get some information. So, uh, Curtis, for the for the benefit of the audience, can you kind of break down because that's the name of the show and that's what we do here? <laughs> what passed uh, in the last le- legislative session, and let's start with that. I'm going to interrupt real quick because this is what I like to do, um, and 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 give you a little friend in your corner. I up uh, different than Jeff. I do support the legalization of marijuana. I was strongly supportive of the legalization of medical marijuana. It is something um, I I am a Republican, but I say I'm a hippie at heart. And this is one that I I do believe um, I am grateful that it is passed. I think for the reform it's going to do for the prison system, um, a lot of folks that have been convicted. I'm interested to hear all about what you've you've been doing and how it came to be. But I wanted to show that you have a friend in your corner. It's not all uh, not all opposition here. (laughs) Sure. Well, yeah, um, this last session of the Minnesota legislature passed adult use cannabis legalization, which means if you are over the age of 21, you can now possess and grow uh, cannabis in your own home. Uh, You can 
have up to four mature plants and you can possess up to two pounds in your own home. And then you can have up to two ounces in your possession when in public in Minnesota. So, uh, so as somebody who's not in this world at all, two pounds feels like a lot. And I have no idea how much two ounces is. Can you give me an idea? Do you have any like sure. uh, like equivalent to a pack of cigarettes or I, I don't I have no basis of knowing uh, of comparison here? Yeah, I would say an ounce is roughly about a, a fistful. So you can have two fistfuls uh, in your possession in public. Okay. And then, um, yeah, two pounds would be uh, 16 times as much as that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. Um, is, and when does the law go into effect? Uh, it goes into effect August 1st for the most part. Um, there were some other aspects of it that have already gone into effect. For instance, uh, marijuana is now a Schedule 3 controlled substance in Minnesota as opposed to a Schedule 1, and that went into effect the day after signing uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it uh, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of uh, government jobs that need to be filled to oversee the whole program. Uh, but within about a year and a half or two years, we'll see uh, shops opening up in Minnesota where people can walk in and make purchases. Now, we had Zach Stevenson on earlier uh, in the session to talk about, you know, his push as the legislative author on this. Um, obviously, things have probably evolved and changed in the language that was was introduced and, and all of that. Um, you know, I know Michael shares Jeff's concerns uh, with the legalization. Uh, Michael, our other co-host uh, that normally is on here. Um, what would you say to folks that do have some concerns uh, for this being legalized, maybe the public safety aspect of it. What what do you say to folks that have those kind of concerns about it? Sure. I mean, one uh, big argument that I often um, uh, mention is that Milton Friedman, you know, no, uh, no fan, obviously, of progressive policies, has publicly stated on multiple occasions that Drug prohibition is the government giving a monopoly to the cartels and the gangs uh, to sell products. Um, just from an economic standpoint, that's what is happening. And those uh, business entities uh, engaged in illegal uh, sales, um, they don't have a dispute resolution system like other companies have where they can go to court and sue one another. Um, instead, what they do is they uh, settle it usually through violence. And so we're seeing uh, in Minnesota right now and for the last 50 years, uh, you know, th these groups settling their scores by killing each other and at just normal citizens are caught in the crossfire. And so I would expect to see with a billion dollar industry suddenly going from illicit to licit, uh, I, I'm expecting to see a decrease in crime in in Minnesota. Uh, additionally, we're not going to be clogging up our courts any longer with uh, cases related to possession or sale of cannabis. And uh, additionally, law enforcement can focus on violent crime, property crime. Uh, in a lot of ways, um, drug prohibition and cannabis prohibition uh, is kind of a, a property crime where uh, law enforcement are told to steal the property of average citizens. And instead, we will now be able to call the police on the phone and say, hey, uh, a crime has occurred. Uh, please help me out. So so let me ask uh, the the Twitter station, Twitter conversation. We kind of had that led to this this booking here. It was about what comes next. W I got the impression your feeling is that all drugs should be, is it legalized or decriminalized? I know there's a difference technically, but it, what's your personal position on that? Or what? 
uh, my personal position is that the free market enterprise system is good, actually, and that small government conservatives should support the free market being applied to all drugs. Uh, so allowing citizens to possess, uh, uh, manufacture or sell drugs uh, it is the, the best way for society. Uh, to move forward, in my opinion. And your and your feeling based on working at the Capitol for the past several years on this type of legislation, how likely is that in Minnesota? Well, it's more likely than it ever has been before. I uh, got involved under Tim Pawlenty's uh, governorship in 2009 uh, at first, and um, there's not a lot of uh movement at the time uh we did pass a medical cannabis bill that year that was only for terminally ill patients and that was vetoed by the governor and then we had uh governor dayton who was also no friend of drug law reform uh but now uh it's a consistent mantra that i'm hearing that prohibition hasn't worked uh you know it it, it is said in the context of cannabis obviously but I think that the public and the politicians are coming to the realization that the prohibition on all drugs um, also has not worked and that there is a need for reform to take place. So I'm not, uh, I actually struggle with this a lot because this is a, this is one of those areas where my personal opinion and maybe my personal principles, I guess, are at are at odds because I'm actually a uh, let's make sure to say small L libertarian at heart in that mm -hmm. I, I do believe in in kind of the minimum amount of of government is the best and and I, I strongly believe that every law that you pass you need to be willing to essentially enforce. Um, with deadly force, because that's that's the ultimate kind of end game on any kind of encounter with law enforcement. It's the that's the worst case scenario, and so you have to be willing to say it, that no matter what the law is, that if this ends in a, in an altercation that escalates to the point of use of uh, lethal force, is is that okay? And I and I struggle with that. So. Um, I, I again, I, I uh, personally, it's the worst smell I've ever smelled in my entire life. I hate it. Um, <laughs> but I understand we don't govern based on uh, what I don't like to smell. Unfortunately, I think things would go quite a bit better if that were true. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> that should be. We should have the the bad smells are. Um, but I, I, you know, I do. I, I actually, I'm a, I'm, I'm a kind of pro everything at heart really uh, so I, I do struggle with that i do struggle with a lot of the um i think that a lot of the i guess call it the science or call it the the arguments made to get to where we got were ingenuous disingenuous and were um and facts were applied kind of loosely but we kind of are where we are and i think so i think the last question i have on this topic is really so now from a federal level right we still have an issue where um where there's a difference now between the the legal status of a particular product at the state and at the federal level and this is something actually uh m many years ago my wife and i uh lived in colorado and this is something that she dealt with firsthand because she worked for a bank and when Colorado legalized marijuana all of these it, they were a federally chartered bank and a federally chartered bank can't allow you to do business in a way that you know on something that's illegal federally and so it created this this situation which I think is also problematic where it became basically an all cash business because these people couldn't find banks and you had to find a, a state chartered bank and those are f kind of few and far between. And um, you end up with some kind of creative um, things there and lots of cash around generally uh, leads to problems too. But what, Curtis, what, what are your thoughts on the federal level? Do you, um, do you have any insight on that or, or where do you think that's going? 
Yeah, uh, President Biden in October of last year, uh, conveniently right before the last election, uh, did direct his uh, Secretary of Health to look into the classification of marijuana as a Schedule One substance. Uh, it's been eight months now, and we have not seen any work product come out of that directive. However, one would assume um, maybe before the next election, a month before, we'll see <laughs> some sort of traction on that. Not just Senate, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, in the meantime, uh, it is uh, true that the uh, the DEA in the Federal Controlled Substances Act has been given authority by Congress uh, right out of the gate in 1970 when the um, Controlled Substance Act was passed initially, and, and it's still there. They have the authority to uh, issue exemptions to the federal law. And so my uh, next big push is to request that the governor's office file a formal petition with the DEA asking that Minnesota's adult use cannabis and medical cannabis programs be exempted from federal law. Uh, obviously, the other option is for Congress to fix this conundrum. <laughs> However, I uh, don't really have a lot of faith that they're looking to to take on something. Always, always bet against Congress. Becky, you had one, one final question. Yep, I have one more question. Um, my question is, again, kind of going back to, to those who over the last years, decades, whatever it might be, are currently sitting in jail due to marijuana-related uh, crimes. Um, is there what happens to those individuals if somebody you know was arrested for having you know two pounds or less than two pounds in their home? Are they released? Are they or is their record expunged? Uh, do you have any information on kind of what what's going on with that side of things? Yeah, uh, Minnesota's law is is fairly good on that topic in that they have decided to issue automatic expungements for anything that was lower than a felony uh, for cannabis-related offenses. And so those, uh, you don't have to a, a petition or apply for an expungement. Um, it'll be automatically granted. And then for people that are currently in jail uh, for cannabis or have a felony on their record, there also is a cannabis expungement board that was created under this new law. And they will uh, be going through the felony level cases and they'll have the discretion to issue expungements, but it's not mandated on. And do you know how many individuals, um, will, are, are impacted by that or will be benefit from that? Any, I mean, really putting you on the spot there. No, it's okay. I think the number was 60,000 Minnesotans will see, uh, an expungement. I think that's through the automatic expungement process. Yeah. Uh, and then perhaps there'll be more with the cannabis expungement board. So it's a quite sweeping change. Um, I think it's uh, a good recognition that human beings should have the privacy right to uh, use substances um, without the government interfering and that the government made a mistake and that that's being uh, rectified by the legislature. I think that's a positive move. All right. Final question, Curtis, Hannah, what's next for you? You've been uh, doing uh, legislative lobbying in Minnesota for the next or for the last several years. I, is the wind kind of out of your sails now because you have your victory or is there are you just getting started? Where are we on the on the on the journey as far as you're concerned personally? Yeah, I kind of feel like a shark and I'm smelling some blood in the water and I want to <laughs> go in and, um, you know, go go for go for broke. I want to see drug prohibition completely end in Minnesota. I don't think we'll get there next session, but I'm going to go as far as I can. The, the next uh, angle that I'm pursuing is the legalization of psychedelic uh, psychedelics for medicinal purposes. Um, there's like literally trials that are showing that some of these substances can completely cure PTSD, which is crazy to say out loud, but it uh, is absolutely fascinating. The, the research is really coming in. And I think that Minnesotans that are 
suffering from mental health issues, uh, many of which were exacerbated under the, the COVID lockdowns. Um, they should have the ability to pursue uh, medicine that really has the potential to cure them. So I'm excited to pursue that and any other reform I can get my hands on. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much Fantastic. for joining us. And where can uh, people follow you on Twitter? That's where I was going next. <laughs> yeah. It's Captain Curtis, and Curtis is spelled with a K. All Fantastic. right. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the show and appreciate you guys having me on. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yep. All right, Becky. So we're going to go crazy. You know, as we talked about earlier, or as you mentioned in the intro there, uh, we are actually going to have two guests in one show. It's the first. It's a first in the very long history of this podcast. Two guests, but we just had two great guests this week. Uh, the next guest actually does not fit the mold of the, um, I, I had a theme of the guests that I was inviting while I was guest hosting here, um, but was going to provide such great content that I decided to just break the theme and go for it. Uh, this is somebody, so the theme, if, if you recall, is people I have never met, but uh, but know from Twitter. But the um, theme works for me. So it uh, was okay, so that there. works. So, so you have not met Brian in 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 real life. Uh, it, it, our, our, so our next guest is Brian Strasser. Um, you may know him uh, as the chairman of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus and Political Action Committee. If you're in uh, into politics here in Minnesota, um, he's also uh, Brian and I actually have. I wouldn't say known each other for a very long time, but we have a we have a shared history because we worked at the same place uh, for for a very long time together. And I would say we worked adjacent to each other. Is that is that I think fair? We never actually crossed paths, which is kind of funny considering that we were at the same place for so long. Yeah, but it was at uh, more than ten years. Yeah, we 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 worked together at the same place, kind of in the same department, but just in different corners of it. So, mm -hmm. um, so I've sort of kind of I've known of Brian for a long time. I don't know if he'd say the same of me. I don't know if I was as infamous as he was. Um, but we actually we invited uh, Brian on today because over the weekend uh, there was a there was a Twitter thread uh, where where. Do we? Do I need to call you like Professor or Doctor Strauser? Or no, what? I, I'm so, a long way from that still. So, so Brian just completed a dissertation as part of the process of earning an a, an MA in International Relations and Contemporary War, which sounds extremely, uh, extremely important and very cool. Uh, but the 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 dissertation, uh, and that that's uh, King's College, King's College London. King's College London. So he's an international scholar. So I think it's fair to say that we have an international scholar on the line today. Uh, and the title of the dissertation is A Discourse Analysis of Donald Trump's and the American Alt-Right's Conception of Truth and Its Implications for Public Discourse, which is a lot of words, but I think you are at this point, Brian, a Donald Trump academic uh, and <laughs> had some things to share. So obviously the big news this week that Donald Trump was indicted uh, for, uh, I guess, technically violations of the Espionage Act. However, it has a lot to do with the um, handling of classified documents. Uh, Brian, you had some insight on kind of what we would see from Donald Trump uh, when we... Um, you know, after after this indictment came down, and then, so do you want to talk a, a little bit about maybe give us a high level overview of what your dissertation is about and kind of what your background and and sort of the academic interest in Donald Trump and the alt right is, and then maybe give us a little bit of color on on the incident itself. So, well, real quick, can we before can I just uh, for anybody who's listening who might be living under a rock, um, just a little couple of details of this indictment before we get into analyzing it. Um, just want to lay out, uh, we did talk about this, you know, it, in our terms of our script, we're going to break down the Trump indictment here. So uh, we did chat about this in April. want to give a shout out to Michael. Uh, he did state at that time that um, that indictment was likely the most inconsequential or weakest of the cases that were to come. It appears uh, as we're seeing this one, that seems to be the trick, the case. Um, this indictment lays out 
37 federal car- charges, felony counts against Trump, 31 of those willful retention of classified documents, um, a whole list of other conspiracy to object- obstruct justice, withholding documents, um, seem to conceal, scheme to conceal and all of the like. Um, according to the indictment, some of these informations included inf- or documents included information about the U.S. nuclear programs, vulnerabilities of the U.S. and its allies to attack, how the U.S. would retaliate in response to an attack, defense and weapon capabilities of the U.S. and non- other countries. Pretty wild. I'm excited to to hear uh, your take as the expert on this. Um, I just want to also n- note that we are taping this on Monday, arraignment likely to, or coming down tomorrow. I apologize, my child screaming in the background. So go for it, Brian. Sure. So I think by way of, by way of academic background anyway, uh, I've just finished four years at King's College London in the Department of War Studies. It's the first department in the world, um, 60 years ago now, that studies the entire interdisciplinary idea of conflict. So war in all of its forms. Um, my dissertation actually started as I was curious about how intelligence agencies have used and morphed strategies towards social media and how they interfere with elections in that way. And in my first, so to get there, you write a dissertation proposal. And then in the first conversation with my assigned supervisor, a professor in the department, uh, to go through my proposal, he goes, you know, this is a great topic, but you have 15,000 words, Brian, and you have to narrow this down to a single simple research question. Have you thought about focusing on Donald Trump and how he uses language? And I said, no. And so we went down this rabbit hole and I got more and more interested in the idea over time. So what I looked at, as, as Jeff said, what I looked at in my dissertation was really what are the language, what's the, the practices and strategies of how Donald Trump speaks, presents himself, chooses words, chooses language in order to effectively communicate the ideas that he has? And how has that sparked the movement that it sparked in the United States? How did that lead to him being elected president? Um, the other end of that, of course, is how do these discursive strategies change how we think about truth? Why do people, for example, accept things that Donald Trump, former President Trump says that are clearly not true as true? And so he, his approach, his choice of language has really influenced how his supporters think about the conception of truth. And that's what I studied. It had nothing to do with any of Trump's policies or judging right or wrong or looking at Biden or Clinton or Obama, as some people on Twitter have suggested. This was the topic that I landed on uh, to research. So that's the high level kind of view of that. And can you can you do me a favor, Brian, and and define to the best of your ability that word discursive? Because it it appears a lot in uh, your writing and and it's kind of a central theme of the writing, but it's not a term that I was familiar with before I got there. So sure. So a discursive strategy is really what is the what is the way in which an individual or uh, a, a party or an organization um, chooses their language, whether it's deliberate or not um, in how they communicate ideas. So I would I could break it up in this way. If you look at, let, let's compare Trump and Obama, just for examples of recent presidents. Um, Trump has a very specific uh, strategy, a discursive strategy of laying out us versus them on a large scale. There is constant reference to um, they're coming for me and then they're going to come for you. Um, he talks about, uh, he, he talks in ways of forming a particular type of shared identity. President Obama, in his rhetoric, does exactly the same thing in a different way. He uh, positions himself as a much more positive leader. He positions himself where, if you think about the themes of his campaigns, have been kind of centered on the idea of hope and change. He's got his own sense of identity related to being a progressive Democrat, maybe not as progressive as some wanted. But he uses discursive strategies as well. They're just stark. They're just markedly different than how Donald Trump approaches rhetoric. 
Um, one thing I do want to point out, you had a really great thread on Twitter over the weekend, um, kind of detailing parts of your dissertation, uh, mm-hmm. along with snaps from uh, Truth Social, um, mm-hmm. showing exactly what what your research found and, and how that is being played out by Donald Trump. I encourage anybody to go over to uh, follow Brian and, and read this thread. I believe it's pinned to the top of your your yeah. profile. Um, it's Brian with a Y, Brian Strasser, last name is S-T-R-A-W-S-E-R, um, to go find this. One, one tweet of that thread that really stood out to me was, um, you said, dog whistling and euphemism are subtle communication techniques often used by Trump. He may use these techniques to communicate his views on the indictment without explicitly stating them. Um, you also go into some other examples of how he uses that. Um, can you maybe detail a little bit more about how those two, dog whistling and euphemism, are are part of what we've already been seeing from him coming out uh, following the indictment last week? Yeah, so clear back to when, you know, you think about the infamous uh, walk down the stairs, well, the, the ride down the escalator at Trump Tower when... Donald Trump announced that he was going to run for president in 2015. Part of that speech, he said, you know, when Mexico sends its people to the United States, they don't send their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending people that have, they're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing those problems with them. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. That's the kind of dog whistling that Donald Trump does. He chooses deliberately provocative language um, that can be widely criticized, but look at the media attention that it garners for him and his cause. And in the same way, that commentary in his announcement speech put the issue of immigration policy right in the middle of the public discourse around Trump's candidacy and an issue that resonated with his base. So it was a very deliberate choice of words that Trump made because that's the kind of discursive strategy that he pursues. In the same way that when he, I I can't remember this weekend if it was Georgia or North Carolina where he said this, in relation to the indictment, he started his his speech by saying, you know, I'm going to, something along the lines of, I'm I'm here to stand in the way of the globalist agenda. And of course, globalist is another dog whistle that's often used to refer to Jewish. It's a fairly anti-Semitic term. Now, he may be thinking of this as I'm trying to stop this global agenda that's anti-American, but it's not perceived that way by his base of support. And it's not perceived that way by the other uh, political side in fights like this. So let me ask you a little bit about dog whistling. Um, uh, That's a term that I think it's used a lot. I Mm -hmm. think it's one of those terms that I think it's overused. you just, you just made a statement there, and and I always feel like maybe I don't have the book or I don't have the secret decoder ring, because when you say – so you made a very, fairly declarative statement there saying, when people say globalist agenda, that means Jewish, right? It doesn't to me. I don't know if that's just because like I'm not plugged in right into the right mm-hmm. crazy lane or whatever, but I I find myself a lot of times when I hear people doing this analysis and saying, oh, this person said that, but what they really meant was this, or they said this and that what they really meant was that. And I feel again, like I, like I don't have, personally, I don't have the secret decoder ring. I don't know what that means. And so, so how does that, I mean, how did you come to that conclusion or, or I'm not saying you're necessarily wrong. I, I just, I just, I just don't know, right? And I and I feel like I feel like sometimes these things are a stretch, right? I mean, you you see you see the the what's the silly thing? We all played the stupid game where you make the okay sign and then somebody yeah. punches you and right. you know and then suddenly it's like oh, some guy at West Point made the okay sign so now they're all white supremacists or something. Right. And so I feel like that gets I, I feel like at least that sometimes this can get kind of silly. So can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I think you have to put it all in context. Um, Like my 12 year old daughter literally gave me the okay sign uh, 15 minutes ago because I asked her how she was. She's not had a great day today. And and she flashed me the okay sign while listening to music on her phone and went back to the basement where she's hiding out. So I was she saying was she using that as a sign of white supremacy? No. Um, But 
I, I think with Trump, you have to look at this in context of what's the body of his rhetoric over the last seven to eight years or earlier. Um, part of, of the research that I did was I literally watched hundreds of hours of Trump. Um, campaign, campaign rallies, Twitter, Truth Social. Yeah, it was brutal. Um, but also his allies. So I think you can, you know, if we use the globalist comment as an example, um, that's a well-known alt-right term uh, as a dog whistle for for Jews or Jewish influence. It plays right into any conspiracy theory you want to think about that's anti-Semitic in nature. And I, th I think you've got to put it in context of, of, of the whole body of work. I think I cite in my dissertation that when Trump fired Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State, you know, Steve Bannon's texting a journalist at Axios saying, come on, dude, this is the end of the globalists. And Tillerson, of course, is Jewish. So you, I think you have to put all of that together. I'm as skeptical as you around a lot of dog whistle terminology, but I think in Trump's case, it applies. Do you actually believe, I mean, based on, so you've done a lot of research. Do you believe he knows what he's saying when he says those things? Or, or do you believe that it's, kind of the people around him I, I i guess where i'm going with this is i've i never i've never felt that donald trump is somebody with a lot of real core values mm -hmm. that he really truly believes in a lot of things i mean other than promoting himself i'm not sure that there's much that he believes in and so i think if he thought he could get um if he thought he could take anything and turn it into some kind of advantage for himself i think he'd believe in it and that's always been part of my problem with with trump in particular is that i don't know that he's a you know so, some of the people that are around him are real crazy nut job conspiracy theory mm -hmm. type people and i think he gets some of that influence but do you believe that he himself kind of buys that those theories or is he in a way i guess co-opting them for his for his personal gain of power for to gain his personal power or or what do you think is going on there i i wish i knew the i i think that um i mean i think i think to some extent trump's landed on some of these things because it has been successful for him and i'll i'll go back to a, a story when he was thinking of running for president um and i don't remember where what book this was in about one of his early stages of his campaign but Steve Bannon went to talk with him about joining the campaign and he asked Trump why he was running and what were some important things to him. And Trump said something, uh, you know, brought up NAFTA and said, you know, these, these people that have lost their jobs over NAFTA, these, you know, automakers and auto workers and iron workers and whatever he was citing, they didn't ask to get screwed, you know, in this treaty, but they did. And I feel like these people need a voice and that I'm someone who could speak for them. I think those are good political instincts, uh, whether somebody told him that or he landed on that himself. Um, but that also plays into these themes of us versus them, right? It's the DC swamp that passed this treaty and screwed all of you. And I'm going to go back and drain that swamp and fight for you. And that feeds into that us versus them mentality. So as you conducted your research, what was I, what was one thing that was maybe the most shocking thing that you kind of uncovered or found uh, through through digging through everything? Anything I stand out? That, yeah, there's – so my research wasn't just about Trump. It, it was about the American alt-right. And the American alt-right got its ideas from Italy and Australia and France where the alt-right movement really kind of started at, at different points in the last 40 years. Um, what I found interesting was how the racial aspects of that, the nationalist aspects of that um, moved throughout those countries and the same themes then came to the United States as our alt-right movement really got moving and led to, over time, Trump's nomination and election as president. I came into that very skeptical that this was a theme, despite the fact my supervisor was beating me over the head with this from the beginning. Um, that you're going to see this. And I'm like, I'm not going to see this, Pablo. Like, I don't believe that. But the research showed that pretty clearly that, 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 that those close ties to the idea of white nationalism are true in all of those countries. And it applies to part of what we do here as well. And then as a follow-up, uh, before we move on to a little bit more about the indictment specifically, um, uh, kind of as a, as a segue into that, 
what would you say if you if you were a betting man and and you know predicting you know I I think in your thread you you talked a little bit about this but what we should expect to see from the president and his messaging um, in the and and his supporters messaging in the mm-hmm. coming days and weeks um, as this plays out. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna see many of the things that uh, we've already started to see over the last couple of days, and even before the indictment. I think as soon as Trump realized that he was in trouble a few months ago, when the special counsel appointed was appointed, um, the president started attacking Jack Smith. He continued to attack Merrick Garland. He will continue to attack and try to dis- find ways to discredit the investigation, try to discredit the FBI. He'll turn on the judge if he thinks that Judge Cannon is not going to side his way as they work through this. Um, We'll continue to see him find ways to um, undermine anything related to this indictment. He'll make the fight about politics and not about what the law is about or even what he's actually charged with. Um, He'll make it about all the ancillary issues around this. So so that's a good opening, uh, Brian. Let's pivot a little bit to the politics of this and you know uh, the i think trump famously said he could shoot someone on fifth avenue and still get elected uh something along those lines right um which he's probably right about mm-hmm. uh it, how do you see, you know, based on the response over the last few days, you've seen some Trump allies kind of stick with them as you would expect. You've seen a few people kind of peel off. Um, you've also seen, I think, people who are, have more familiarity with the legal system specifically kind of after they read the indictment say, whoa, wait a minute here. Like this may actually be the one that gets him. Um what what's your feeling but brian based on what you're seeing on the politics or the legality i i I think on that i guess that's a good question right because there are two separate there there are two separate things let's do the political side at this point what from the political side does he survive this do people stick with him I think Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee in 2024 and he will lose the general election and will drag we will lose control of the United States Congress in the process. I agree. Well, that's depressing. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say I think, you know, what we have seen is a little bit of our first kind of run on red commentary here. Um mm-hmm. We, we, of course, saw an evolution over the weekend, I think, on Thursday. Um, most of them, uh, most of the fellow Republican candidates for president, um, you know, took aim at the the targeting of, of you know, from the Biden administration and their weaponizing political weaponization of, of the offices and, and everything of that sort. I do think this started to shift a little bit. Um, of course, my my guy Christy uh, was um, was a little bit more outspoken of that. Um, mm-hmm. There were some more of the candidates kind of getting either remaining silent, which I think is telling in itself, um, or you know Haley over the weekend said if this indictment is true, um, if it says what it's actually the case, President Trump was incredibly reckless with our national security. Now that's a tiptoeing, uh, you know, testing the waters to see how that plays, right? Which I think is really telling. I think that we are going to see maybe a little bit more of this. These vague kind of. Uh, if statements, if this is the case, if this is, you know, I have more questions, I am concerned if he's found guilty. Um, but I think that door is being left open. And I think it's kind of, from my perspective as a, a non-Trump supporter, it's exciting that it's being left open, that nobody, you know, that not, I won't say nobody, that they're not all 100%, you know, balls to the walls, you know, uh, supporting President Trump in, in, in every breath they take. Um, so I, I do like that. I think it's going to be, um, we have a lot of time yet to, to see how that plays out, how the base plays. If that, you know, bumps them in polls or drops them in polls, I, I, I would expect polls are being conducted currently, if not in the coming days to see how that does come out. Um, but do you expect, you know, what are your guys' takes? Do you think we'll see more of these candidates starting to test the waters and coming out maybe a little bit harder on Trump than they would have a week ago. I don't. You don't? 
No, I mean, Axios, I'm sorry, not Axios, ABC has a poll out uh, this afternoon where they polled in several states and came back and 80% of Republicans they polled said they they more strongly support Trump post-indictment than they did pre-indictment. Oh God, it's so sad. One question I did have, I've seen a couple of articles about this, um, but what your guys' take is, Republicans, one of the things we've been pounding our chest about for the last number of years in particular is law and order, right? That we do have a justice system. We are a nation of laws. Those laws are meant to be upheld. The people in power are the ones to to uphold them. What are your take on how this message, how this impacts that messaging when it comes to crime, violent crime, when it comes to securing our borders and any illegal immigration? What do you how do you, how do you think these presidential candidates or or just Republicans as a whole? I mean, we know we have a failure in messaging, but if you know, how, how are they going to play with that? Well, I mean, personally, I find it hypocritical. It, look, if, if we believe in law and order, then we should believe in law and order for everyone. Right. And our, our values should not um, be different because it's someone on our theoretical side here that's been indicted. He certainly has a right to a fair trial and, and a trial before a jury of his peers. Um, and when that's over and he's convicted, then we should think of it in that way. Um, but I, I think the number of Republicans that are running to his defense, I think makes our entire law and order message hypocritical. So I, I'm going to take the, a different tact on this because I, because somebody has to, right. I, I do believe it's possible to both think that, uh, the timing of the indictment, the way that this went down, all of these things stink, but that Donald Trump is also guilty. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, it's funny because people like to say that the, this thing about uh, the law and order and and all and all of those things. And uh, to me, I guess, as somebody who would consider myself fairly law and order, a, a, a pretty strong supporter of local law enforcement, there's always been a carve out in my mind for the FBI specifically. Uh, the FBI has been historically uh, corrupt from its inception. I mean, um, J. Edgar Hoover was not a good guy. He didn't follow the law. He didn't, um, uh, he, you know, he played dirty. And uh, and I think that there is some of that DNA in the FBI. And the FBI, I think specifically, not, not to say every FBI agent is bad. I wouldn't, I would never make that type of claim, but the FBI as a, as a political apparatus uh, definitely has made some questionable moves in the, in the last several years. So I think it's fair to uh, hold both things simultaneously and say, Hey, the department of justice and the FBI are overly political and we've got a problem there. Um, But also uh, Donald Trump is guilty. I mean, I I think, and uh, that's, uh, that's one guy's opinion. I think that certainly takes a, a well-versed messenger. Uh, so Jeff, we're signing you up for that job. Uh, to try I'm not to saying, that. look, I, I don't know that it is a winning message, honestly, <laughs> but I, but I mean, from an intellectual standpoint, um, you know, the, it, it just, there are some, I mean, the FBI has not covered itself in glory over the past several years. And, and I think it's not, I don't think it's necessarily hypocritical to be able to point that out because we need to hold law enforcement accountable when they do, when they do bad things, just as we do with local cops, when they, when Mm -hmm. they do bad things, we need to hold them accountable. We need to hold this kind of uh, national security apparatus accountable as well. I'm not going to go and tell you there's some kind of globalist agenda necessarily, um, but I am going to say that I am going to say that that you know it is a bit problematic, and that you know that's what makes me. And it's always made me a um, small C, however you want to call it, small government conservative. Is that I I want the government to be small so that the the vector for the abuse of power is as small as possible because power generally gets abused um, at every level. And so uh, that's why, you know, that's why the smaller the government, the better the government generally. Um, I'm not a no government uh, uh Anarchist. Absolutist. Yeah, I'm not. I, I mean, I, 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 we, we need laws, um, but we need to have, we need to have a, a system 
we need to have a system where I think the powerful can be held accountable, but not in a way that stinks. And so that's part of what kind of is causing me a little bit of heartburn here that, you know, that it has to be Trump who gets to be the poster child of this. But, um, you know, I, I think clearly if everything is as is written in the indictment, then um, then there are serious issues. But I think it's also fair to question kind of how we got here. So I, I disagree. Oh, oh, go ahead, Brian. I was going to say, I, I, I'll add uh, maybe a slightly different take on that. Um, assuming what's in the, in the, in the indictment is accurate and this was properly investigated in accordance with our laws and the rules of criminal procedure, the FBI's job is to investigate the facts. It's the U S attorney's job, or in this case, the special counsel's job to decide whether or not to prosecute. The FBI cannot make prosecutorial decisions on their own. They're an investigative agency and they did that here. Uh, and handed over that information to the special prosecutor, special counsel, um, who continued with an investigative plan and then made those decisions. Um, if, if this was me or you or anyone else that had a security clearance who willfully withheld this information, we would have been arrested about three days after the search warrant. I think they've shown significant deference to the former president before reaching this rather momentous decision to proceed with an indictment. And part of, I mean, the, 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 the DOJ's own rules on, um, indicting for federal crimes require them to believe that they have the proper evidence and that they're able to win the case. So I think, um, so again, I, I, that's very nice. I'm not discounting what you said, but that's a very nice sentiment. Um, I think part of where you lose this because, because things don't exist in the bubble of academia or higher thought right they exist in the in the realm of politics and so i think where you start to lose people is the is by kind of the outsized um reactions to things like this it's not being treated on the democrat side as this is a very somber thing this is something we took very seriously this is you know it was an extraordinary step but it had to be done because whatever it's 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 party time. We finally got him. You know, we've been mm -hmm. after him for years. We we tried to impeach him before he was even in office. So let's go, and and now we now we're finally going to get him. And so I think that 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 again, we we talked a little bit last week about people in the middle and how when when I use that term meaning in the middle, that doesn't mean necessarily people without opinions, but it means people who look to both political parties and think, what the hell is going on? I don't want any part of either of that, right? Yeah. And I think that that is the vast, vast majority of Americans at this point are looking around going, you guys are all nuts. Um, but so I, I don't know. That's well, and the, and the, other, on the other difficulty here too, and this goes back to, to political rhetoric, right? Is there's wide misunderstanding of other investigations involving other presidential candidates or current or former presidents or former VPs who have also been discovered to have had classified material. Hillary Clinton's email issue, Mike Pence having documents, the president Biden having documents in a, a couple of locations and how those are different and similar at the same time. It's not, I don't think any of those are well understood. And nor and are I they think, easy topics to explain. Right. And that, I think that's also how we end up here is that w the more complex the crime, the harder it is to explain to people. And, you know, the, the bullet points sound, if the bullet points sound the same, then they must be the same, right. uh, which causes some trouble for us. And I, I, I want to make one quick point uh, before we do move on. Um, uh, Donald Trump did tweet today, or, or I can't say tweet, um, posted, whatever you call posting on Truth Social. He truthed? Did he, he truth? truth. He truth. truth. Um, that when he wins, he will appoint a real special mm -hmm. prosecutor to go after the most corrupt president in the history of the USA, Joe Biden, the entire Biden crime family, and all others involved. I mean, so again, it just kind of is like, here you go, saying it's targeted, and then coming out and saying, when I am, if I am reelected, I am going to also target it's just wild. You, you literally can't make this up. We need a new season of Veep in my mind to to have this all play out. Well, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't target people politically, but we should have put Hillary in prison and then the entire Biden crime family in prison. Lock but her not, up, right? Not on Trump. Um, I do, I, I, can I say though, 
the Biden crime family is a really great little soundbite. That is a, that's a fan, that's fantastic messaging. It's right up there with Ron Sanctimonious. Okay. So that's terrible messaging. The Biden crime family is good messaging. Yeah. The, the sanctimonious thing, I, it, it really depresses me. I mean, I, you just feel like, you feel like the guy who gives out the nicknames really should be able to do better than to, to sanctimonious. It doesn't, it doesn't roll off the tongue. It's just awful. Meatball Ron was a better name. If All we're right. going to call him something, Meatball I'm going to roll us back in here, Jeff. Uh, we are up against the clock here. I want to make sure we don't forget, forget two of our favorite segments of the show. Um, we are going to have Brian stick it out with us as we go into the food fight. Um, in this week's food fight, we are breaking down favorite barbecue side dishes. So... I feel very strongly about sides. I could eat sides for every every meal without a, a main dish, I think. So let's get started. Jeff, we'll kick it over. We'll go one, 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 and down the list, uh, one being your your favorite. All right. My first is potato salad, specifically my dearly departed grandmother's potato salad. She took the recipe with her to her grave because that's what grandmothers do. Uh, my brother actually tried to watch her make the potato salad one time. Uh, he swears that while his back was turned, she put in whatever the secret ingredient is, uh, just so that we'd keep missing her. So, uh, love you, Grandma. Miss the potato salad. Becky, what you got? All right. My number one is corn on the cob. Midwest girl. You got to do it. Uh, Okay. Simple as that. You're number one. Collard greens. Yeah, so uh, we knew that was coming. We had a little bit of a, a, a text exchange before here, so I knew that that was going. Do you have anything in particular? Is there a certain uh, place to get them from? A certain preparation, it, or is it just they're good? To, it's good. To- um, yeah, I mean, the the best collard greens I've ever had is from the Rendezvous in Memphis, which is okay. kind of the the home of of uh, Memphis barbecue. So it doesn't get any better than that. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with another salad uh, for number two, chicken salad. Uh, specifically, now I have I have three aunts. So I have my wife's aunt on one side who makes a great chicken salad. And then I have an aunt on both sides, my mom's uh, sister and my dad's sister who make a phenomenal chicken salad. So uh, as long as the aunties are around, I'm eating good chicken salad. So I got to ask, though. So this is a side dish. So you're having like ribs and chicken salad? You can have chicken salad. Anytime you want. Sure. For right. anything. My number two. It's a meal and a side. My number two is a baked potato on the grill. You get a little bit of that extra crispy right. outside, nice fluffy inside with all the fixings. And if she's mm-hmm. feeling wild, she might put some salt and pepper on it. Oh, always. Let's not, let's, let's not get too crazy. Brian, you're number two. Uh, potato salad. It's got to be a mustard-based potato salad, though. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Uh, my number three, um, elote. So uh, Mexican street corn. Yeah. So uh, specifically, so I'm going to tell a quick story. So we have a we have a local festival here in Crystal. Uh, and you know, like every small town around does, right? And one year, uh, we got the corn lady to come out. And she made this elote, and she had she had the trailer up and had it going for a few hours, and then she had a heart attack, and couldn't come back to the rest of the festival, and has never been back. She lived, thankfully, but it was like the best uh, elote I've ever had, and the poor lady had a heart attack after setting up her uh, her food booth. I just I felt awful for her um, and for my stomach. <laughs> Brutal. Uh, my number three, I am going to join the bandwagon here, is also a potato salad. Fantastic. Can't argue. No. Uh, that. Brian, wait, number three. Brian, yeah, number three. Coleslaw. Coleslaw. Good, okay. creamy, vinegary coleslaw. Uh, nobody on earth does coleslaw better than KFC. I'll fight you to the death on it. KFC, that's solid. Uh, I think okay. Popeyes is better. Oh, no, absolutely not. Uh-huh. Nope. All right, my number four is kind of reluctant. Uh, I'm going to say beans, but I'm going to also say that they better have bacon or ground beef or something else in them because don't just give me a can of bushes and be like, oh, hey, here's your beans. You better have done something. 
to gussy those things up because I don't want to eat your regular old beans, okay? And no, the like the kind that comes with like the weird bacon that's like mummified in there that doesn't count. That's oh yeah, same. gross. So my number four is also coleslaw, and also specifically KFC coleslaw. Oh, I am a big fantastic. fan. You know, I I as much as I love sides, I I feel like this is an awful uh, food fight because we're all just in too much of agreement here. Uh, but I'm not going to be able to pick on your list after this. That's what I'm saying. There's so much overlap. It's I, I, know. I don't know. All right, Brian, number four. Corn pudding. Sweet corn pudding. Sweet mm. corn pudding. You lived in the South, yes? At some no, point? Or, I'm from no? Indiana. You just, you, you just, isn't Indiana the South? It's south of me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible Belt. the texture of you. corn pudding. Kind of hop That's up. where you yeah. lose me. Yeah. Okay. So we can agree on we don't like Brian's number four. All right. Cool. Awesome. Uh, my, my last one is, is another kind of reluctant one. It's generic in the terms that it's pasta salad. And here's my problem is that I've never found the perfect pasta salad. I keep searching for it. I've tried different recipes. I keep, I, I order it anytime I get across it, but I feel like I'm always a few steps away from perfection and that, that there's a lot of ways to do pasta salad. There's a lot of ways to do pasta salad kind of mediocre. So I've got a great pasta salad. Um, it's not necessarily one I would say is like, I think it's more of like a main dish pasta salad than a side dish, but I'll make it for you sometime. Fantastic. Um, my number five is, you know, now we're just going boring is Mexican street corn salad. So, you know, Jeff already. Oh, that's good. I that. like it. I don't that's, have a good story fantastic. about a heart attack. No, but... That's a good one. All right, Brian, your last one. Jalapeno cornbread made in a cast mm. iron skillet. Okay. I yeah, this was a good. Bread. Th- this was a good list this week. I I feel like I just don't feel like fighting. I guess I don't know. It was good. <laughs> and I haven't yeah. eaten dinner yet, so I uh, <laughs> am now hungrier than I was twenty minutes ago. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much to our guest Brian Strasser. I really appreciate it. Would love mm-hmm. to have you back on sometime to talk about many of your other things that you do because you wear many many hats. Uh, but I really appreciated the conversation. Of course. Uh, maybe we'll yeah, have you back on to talk Trump too. But I think that would just. Um, you know, you don't want to beat your head against the wall too much for that. So uh, thanks again, Brian Strasser. Appreciate yep. it. And thanks Brian, where me. can you uh, just, again, spell your name so if people can come find you on Twitter, read your dissert- yeah. or read your thread, and, and eventually, hopefully, your dissertation? Yeah, it's uh, you find me on Twitter at Brian Strasser, B-R-Y-A-N-S-T-R-A-W-S-E-R. And uh, my longer version of my dissertation should be out in about a week. Fantastic. Awesome. We will be sure to link. We'll be sure to link from that or link to that, I guess, uh, when we get there. All and right. congratulations. Thank you so much. And, and we'll you. talk soon. All right. Thank you, Brian. All right, Becky, I think that's the first time we've had an international scholar on the show, and I'm excited about it. I love it. Uh, we should get more international scholars. I'll do my best. I don't know that Minnesota Republican Party or Minnesota activist uh, and my Twitter, our Twitter peeps are, are you know, overflowing with that. Um, I think Brian might be the only one, but uh, we'll see what we can find. You never know. All right. So Tweet of the Week, what do you got? You got anything good this week? I sure do. I'm giving mine is a an ode to uh, the OG of this podcast, our namesake, Michael Broadcorp. Over the weekend, he tweeted, what? come on, I got to He tweeted, cold, hard truth. Trump could walk on stage at the 2024 Republican <laughs> National <laughs> Convention <laughs> in Milwaukee next July wearing an ankle monitor and the crowd could, would go wild. And I mean, there's nothing true or said. We talked about it a little uh, bit. He's, he's probably right. Yeah. Uh, Mine goes, mine actually uh, just squeaked in and out of the wire. It came out uh, today at about 2.30. Uh, so today is, uh, of course, I don't know what day it is. Uh, when you're listening to this, it'll be a few days ago. But that was kind of a stupid diversion. Let's move on. Uh, somebody named Stephen Rubis, uh, who I've followed for a long time. I don't know exactly who he is or why He's I'm great. following him. But uh uh, Brian Baxt from uh, NPR wrote, missed this, but 2022 Republican uh, govern- governor candidate Scott Jensen recently closed his campaign account after paying final bills, including $19,740 to repay a personal loan with interest. Jensen told me last week he is not eyeing up a run for Senate or another office. And Rubis tagged that and said, Thank God, but now we have to start over in finding a person with no general election appeal. Anyone know what Doug Wardlow is up to? So Stephen, a man after my heart, taking a shot at uh, 
both Scott Jensen and Doug Wardlow. Grade A losers, both of them. Steven Rubis, I hope your golf game is good. You've got a little golf icon there up there. Uh, so uh, one more time, Scott Jensen, Doug Wardlow, grade A losers. Wanted to make sure I make that point as <laughs> clear as possible. I appreciate the double down there. Thank you. Well, in closing here, we want to thank you for listening to The Breakdown with Broadcorp and Becky featuring Jeff Kolb. Before we go, show um, show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or the platform where you listen. You can also leave us a review on our website at bbbreakpod.com. Again, that website is bbbreakpod.com. Also on Twitter at bbbreakpod.com. Listen to this and previous podcast come out every thursday morning um the breakdown with broad corp and becky and cole will return next week have a great week thanks everybody